Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Here we are once again to find mean Jesus in these words. Mean Jesus, not the Jesus that we put in our minds and think of as the great conscious, conscience genie. That who you come and you rub and then soothes you according to your own conscience. That's called, um, that's called moral therapeutic deism. In other words, you use God as a therapy device. You use God in order to... Have you, ever, have you ever wondered what God's will was and noticed that it was exactly your own? That's what moral therapeutic deism is. We excuse our actions by using God as a scapegoat. As long as God agrees with me, I've got a weapon to yield. And isn't that the purpose of God? Is that we can beat each other over the heads with Him? Oh wait, that's, that's, not, that's not right. That doesn't seem right to me. So what is Jesus saying here? If anyone comes to me and he does not hate, well what Jesus is this who speaks of hate? That doesn't seem like the Jesus that I know that the Bible told me loves me so much. That's not the Jesus that I understand. The Jesus that I understand is only love, is only peace, is only kindness. It's Jesus is the Jesus of the 60s and 70s. Peace, love, and a little hatred. So why does Christ say this? And did they understand it? And do you understand it? Because if you understand it, and if I am able to explain it well enough, what Christ is saying is that you are to be reflective and repentant. You are to look at your life not as a gift from God, but as a vessel of witness. You've been given a life in order to witness to Christ. And that is truly a gift. But if you do not reflect upon yourself and upon your family that you are nothing, then the forgiveness of Christ cannot enter into you. Luther says, there are two parts to confession. First, that you confess your sins. And second, that you believe that He who is the forgiveness of sins will do it. In other words, you can't repent if you don't believe that you won't be forgiven. If you believe that you won't be forgiven, you will not be. In other words, you cannot repent rightfully without believing that you will be forgiven. It's impossible. Which means that we have to lie down, prostrate ourselves before God and say, as Luther did, I am but a worm. I am yours. Save me. When Christ says this, these things that hit our ears so abrasively, He means those words. We can't go, ah, that's, that's, that's mean Jesus. We'll put Him over here and we'll put happy Jesus back right here. See, Mean Jesus and happy Jesus is the Jesus of the cross and the Jesus of the, of the resurrection. He's the Christ of the empty tomb. And if He says to you that your salt is good, then thanks be to God. And yet if your salt has lost taste, how shall it be restored unto you? You are neither worth anything to the soil 
nor to the manure pile. Useless you are to Christ. He says these words. I've told you many times that I am not, I don't have the liberty of an opinion. I live by the word of God and what it tells us. What Christ writes, or what Christ has written through his holy disciples. And this is what he has written. We are worthless outside of Christ. Because you are neither, neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth, says the Lord. And if Christ were to come back today, and the dead to my right were to gather into this congregation, into this building, and see Christ, how would you present yourself? Think, uh, really think about that. How would you prevent your, pre pre how would you <laughs> present yourself, not prevent yourself, present yourself to Christ? Would it be with your works? Look at my heart. Look at what I've done for you. Or would it be face down on the floor? And your answer to that question reflects what you think about yourself. If your answer is, I would give him my money and my gold. I would give him my wife, my children, my brothers, and my sisters. I would give him everything except my life. Then you love your life more than Jesus. That's just the facts. I'm not giving you an opinion. And so you, dear salt, when Christ says that you have taste, you have taste indeed. Christ is not telling you here that you have lost your taste. He says to be weary of losing your taste. Because what builder before building a building, does not sit down and look over the plans or the blueprints today or the schism schismatics today. And we've been through it, right? We sit in a chapel, in a church, after what seemingly was a disastrous and permanent fire. We formed a building committee. Who was on that committee? So it sounds to me like y'all sat down and looked at some plans. You didn't just go and put brick out in mud. What king, when looking at an opposing force, says, can I win this battle? No king. He's either going to judge the army by his own might or he's going to send somebody for peace. And that's what God the Father did. He looked at his enemy, which is sin, death, and the devil, and he sent his son to win the victory for us. He sent his son to give us the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lois, you have faithfully been tending the soil of our youth. We can't be grateful enough for you. Know that it's through Christ, and through Christ alone, through you, that many members sit here today and believe. That's no small thing. Because when we talk to our little ones, what are we to tell them about Jesus? What are we going to tell them? That if you do not deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow Him, you cannot have salvation? Is that what we tell them? 
Yes. But there are ways in which people need speaking to. And that's why Christ has these words for those who were around him. Remember, he was speaking to all generations here. We speak to our children in those terms, but in these words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide. What great theology there is in that. How simple it is to grasp. How much does God love me? So much that He sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The gates of heaven are opened and closed by the hinges of the wounds of God the Son's hands. And they're open unto little children and they are open unto you. Fear not of losing your saltiness. For the only reason you have taste is because, is because God gave it to you. Cast away this idol of moral therapeutic, de therapeutic deism. God is not your therapist. He does not care about how you feel about everything. Because He put all of His chips into His Son so that you would have the forgiveness of sins. He cares what you feel about that. Because your passion for that matters. Your passion for the Gospel resonates throughout the community. Your passion and understanding of the forgiveness of sins is your entire life and salvation. Outside of that, there's just the, McDonald, the McDonald's Jesus. One size fits all Jesus. Post-production Jesus. Bite size or fun size Jesus. But that's not the God that we have. And that's fortunate for us. Because we despise ourselves Christ loves us. So my warning here is this. And I speak to myself as well. Don't think too much of yourself. I know it sounds that uh, very simple. Don't think too highly of yourself than you ought. Because that is the job of Jesus Christ. As Bo Geertz once said in The Hammer of God, in a conversation it, uh, in, in his book, it says, it, from one passage to another, one says, Sir, are you a believer? The bishop that he's talking to says, Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a believer? And he says, Well, sir, don't you know? And the bishop says, no, I don't know. He says, well, I've given my heart to Jesus. And the bishop says, what a fine birthday present indeed that you would give him something so disgusting. See, the heart of man, he goes on, is like a rusty old tin can at the top of a garbage heap. Yikes. The heart of man is like a rusty tin can on the top of a garbage heap. But a good Lord passes along, sticks his walking cane through it, takes it home, polishes it up, cleans it up, and places it on the shelf. That, my boy, that is how it is. How true is that? And we ought to think of ourselves likewise as that rusty old tin can in whom Christ has pierced us through holy baptism, has taken us home. He who should have no interest in us whatsoever has cleaned us up and has placed us on the shelf. 
He has taken the diamond out of his own crown and placed you in it. Thanks be to God. Put not your trust in princes, nor in yourself. Put not your lives in princes or in yourself. Put them not in your family or in your friends. Put them in community into Christ Jesus. Because at the end of the day, He's all you have. That's it. And so if we are united with Him in a death like His, so we will also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. If you love your family, bring them to church. If you love your family, tell them about Jesus. Deny yourself. Pick up the cross and follow him unto the end of the age. That's the beauty of Augustana Lutheran Church and why I take so much pride in her is because Augustana Lutheran Church is never far from the cross of Jesus Christ. Only as far as three days from the tomb. We live life on this side of the resurrection waiting for the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting amen thanks be to god christ has forgiven us of our sins amen